All right, welcome back everybody. Hope everybody was able to um, get a good break in. Uh, we got some good presentations coming up. Um, so in the interest of time, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, one thing I did want to mention, I put the link for the um, CEUs, the Google form. Um, and one thing you can do, you can click on that link um, and then you can, you know, every 15 to 20 minutes, you can, um, once you submit the response, it will give you the option to submit another response. You can just leave that web page open. Um, I set it up so that you could have multiple responses. Um, so you can either do it that way or just every time I send out, you know, before and after the um, presentations, you can click on that link that I post in the chat. Um, so either way is fine, whatever's easiest for you. Um, if you have any, you know, any questions, you can send me, you know, something on the chat um, and, and I can try to help you out. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with our first uh, presentation. It'd be from Dr. Travis Gannon. He's a, an associate professor at um, NC State, and he is going to talk to us about um, glyphosate. Um, so. Uh, whenever you're ready, Dr. Gannon. Can you see that, Drew? Yes, we're good. Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction. It's my pleasure uh, to be with you all this morning. Um, and I'll just be sharing a little bit of, uh, you know, normally we start these out by share, uh, saying we'll share some information specifically about uh, a certain issue or topic, uh, which we'll certainly do this morning, but we'll also uh, talk about some misinformation that's circulating. And, you know, we'll talk about glyphosate a lot, but the reality of it is that, uh, you know, scrutiny around pesticide use is, uh, you know, I don't want to say an all time high, if you will, but it's certainly an issue and it's going to become more of an issue um, as we move forward. So, you know, I, I throw this picture up there and, you know, some people laugh out loud at it, but the reality of it is that everything with respect to pesticides and equipment, spray equipment that we use today and other types of equipment as well, uh, has changed drastically in the last several years. And of course, this was taken several decades ago, but, uh, you know, the mindset around pesticide use, I mean, it's, it's real in the world we live in today. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation floating around and, you know, it can be argued that everything and it's not literally everything, but certainly most things with respect to pesticides that we use today. As well as the application equipment has changed significantly and we'll, we'll talk about a few of those things, but, uh, you know, I think this picture does a good job of just um, elaborating on how much uh, things have changed with respect to pesticide use. Uh, it's not only pesticides. This was a real uh, ad from a magazine in the in the in the late '60s, I believe it was. Uh, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. You know, it, again, it's not just pesticides. It's it's you know a lot of facets and a lot of uh, components of society. Every everything has changed. So, uh, you know that that's I, I like to start off with this because it really uh, puts into perspective, uh, you know, the world we live in today, if you will, and and exactly how much things have changed. You know, one of the things that we talk about uh, a lot when we talk about pesticide use and how to deal with people that are um, anti-pesticide or what have you, uh, this is uh, obviously a picture of uh, orange juice jug on the left and a bag of carrots on the right uh, taken from a, a grocery store. And, you know, the, the reality of it is, you know, and this isn't a, a sexist comment by any stretch, but, you know, most in, you know, not, not all, but a lot of households, women do the shopping, right? And they see that, and, it, and it's, you know, males as well, you know, they see this uh, label here, non-GMO project verified, and they assume that, that, that uh, you know, it's, it's in most cases correlated with the use of Roundup or glyphosate, right? 
when in, in actuality, um, you know, of course, there are no Roundup Ready oranges or Roundup Ready carrots, but, you know, untrained people, uh, this is how misinformation gets started. And they'll, they'll, in many cases, pay, whether it's this or an organic label, uh, they'll, they'll pay for something, they'll pay more for something because um, they assume it to be uh, safer and better. And, you know, again, that's just one snippet of misinformation uh, that, that's in prevalent in today's society. Uh, again, the non GMO project, um, you know, it's largely a, a marketing. Um, uh, marketing project, I guess, is the best way to put it to put it lightly. Um, you know, it has nothing to do with uh, specifically when you're talking about Roundup Ready crops and stuff like that, which is what most people uh, associate it with. Uh, as we've talked about, you know, a lot of things have changed and, you know, there are people that today make their entire uh, careers or professions on uh, studying the, the, uh, the effects of social media on society. You know, and, you know, I'm not here to comment on that, but the reality of it is that social media platforms, while they can be good on uh, on some fronts, you know, in many cases, they're they are loaded with misinformation. And of course, that misinformation in many cases spreads like wildfire, whereas, you know, many uh, factual based or fact sheets or um, anything of that nature uh, doesn't get shared as much, whereas, you know, things that have a fear factor or organizations or individuals that are, you know, catering to, to fear mongering activities, you know, that they use these platforms very wisely. And the reality of it is in the world that we live in, these things get spread very, very quickly. So as I said earlier, we'll be talking, we'll be focusing on glyphosate a lot today. Again, a lot of these principles, um, you know, apply to various pesticides and a lot of the scrutiny is not limited only to glyphosate or Roundup, but uh, you know, many other pesticides are, uh, are quote unquote under attack. So I like to ask this question. I know it's, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult being virtual here, but so Roundup or, uh, well, glyphosate was originally registered as uh, Roundup herbicide. And of course there are many generic formulations now, uh, but it was first registered, first released, excuse me, in 1974. So, you know, I like to pose the question and get, the, get people to thinking, you know, why, why was it, you know, um, you know, why has it been registered so long yet? It's only been a problem just say for the last several years, maybe a decade. And, you know, that's, that's a very good question and a very good thing to point out. And we'll get, we'll get to some of that uh, a little bit later. Uh, as you all know, glyphosate is highly efficacious, non-selective herbicide. It's registered in, in over a hundred countries in both residential and commercial settings. Um, you know, and we'll commonly hear that glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, uh, is an EPSPS enzyme inhibitor, which I don't expect you to, to get into the weeds on that one. But we'll often hear that it's a pathway, it only inhibits plants because the pathway only exists in plants. Well, that's true on one hand. On the other hand, uh, just because something, uh, acts herbicidally by attacking a specific enzyme path that only exists in plants, that doesn't mean that it can't adversely affect other organisms. So, you know, it's, it's very important when you're having these conversations with clientele, customers, board members, whomever it may be, that, you know, you, you, you tell the whole story and you, 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 you know, make, make everything factual based. So the mere fact that Roundup doesn't affect other organisms because the enzyme only exists in plants is not in, not entirely true. So just, and again, we don't need to spend a lot of time here, but this is just, these are pictures demonstrating an area on the left here, sprayed with glyphosate, um, you know, on the left side of this picture on the right side here, and in the uh, background, it was sprayed with glyphosate. The, the point is with this picture is that glyphosate, um, you know, in, in all reality, it's one of the, the safer, uh, from an environmental fate standpoint, it's one of the safer herbicides that we used. And this picture simply depicts that, you know, you spray a herbicide here, obviously there's a crisp line, you know, it's not subject to, to lateral mobility or runoff or volatility. And that's largely because of the physicochemical properties of it, uh, which cannot be said for all the uh, pesticides and specifically herbicides that we use today. 
So the point is, um, you know, I'll get back to it a few times, but with glyphosate having been registered uh, since the mid seventies, why is it, you know, under attack today and for the last several years? And, you know, one of those main reasons is because, um, you know, it's the number one used herbicide uh, in the world. So that uh, unto itself lends itself to, uh, to a lot of scrutiny. But as far as the environmental fate, of it, um, you know, again, it's one of the safer, safer products we use. Uh, you know, you'll also hear information about glyphosate last forever, right? And that's absolutely not true. The, in aerobic soils, uh, the typical half-life of glyphosate is 47 days, which is, you know, moderate, but the, you know, this information about glyphosate persisting in soils and then in, in media forever, uh, that's absolutely not true. So again, getting back to why is glyphosate such a problem now? So this is uh, herbicide use, uh, glyphosate use, excuse me, uh, from 1994 until 2014. Um, uh, and this is on a global scale here. So again, I pose the question, why is glyphosate under attack now when you know it's registered for the you know for 20 years before uh, before these data start? And, you know, prior to the, you know, early 2000s, um, you know, less of it was used. Now, what does that correspond with? Well, in, in 1990, between mid 90s, the first Roundup Ready crop uh, was introduced. There was wide scale adoption after that. Hence, you see in the, the light green bars here red, represents agricultural use of uh, glyphosate. Again, this is on a global scale. Um, and non-ag, so non-crop land, specialty crops, so um, uh, those types of sites are represented by the purple bar here. And so again, we you know we posed the question earlier: Why is glyphosate under attack today? When you know it's been registered since the mid '70s, and you know arguably for the first several decades it was registered, it it it, it wasn't under attack. And again, it's the largest, uh, the, the most widely herbicide used globally. And again, that largely corresponds with the uh, adoption of Roundup Ready cropping technology. Uh, it's also important to point out here that yes, has Roundup use increased? Yes, over time. However, in the non-ag or the non-cropland arena, has it increased? You know, over this time period, sure. Has it increased to the level it has in agricultural commodities? Absolutely not. So again, glyphosate, the most widely used uh, herbicide globally. Uh, its increase over time is depicted here. Again, this is on a global scale. And this unto itself lends it lends itself to, uh, you know, scrutiny around glyphosate simply because it's the number one used herbicide. However, what you won't hear talked about is, so that the previous slide was on the global scale. This is on the uh, national scale here. Uh, and this is the use of some uh, products that were used prior to the introduction of Roundup Ready crops. So allochlor, cyanazine, metolachlor, all very commonly used herbicides. Glyphosate here on the right with the light green bars. Again, we see the same trend um, on the national scale here that we saw on the global scale in the previous slide. And this is what, you know, people that are trying to attack glyphosate, this is one of the first things that they'll go to, right? But what they don't um, bring light to or mention is that, yes, glyphosate use has increased, that's true. But what they won't bring light to or mention is that uh, the use of more toxic compounds has decreased over this same time frame. And we won't get into all the nuts and bolts here, but uh, the acute oral LD50 for glyphosate being over 5,000 milligrams of glyphosate per kilogram of body weight Whereas each of these alternatives, again, allochlor, cyanazine, as well as metolachlor, having much lower LD50s, indicating they're more acutely toxic uh, than glyphosate. So again, the point being, has glyphosate used to increase over this time frame? Yes. However, uh, the use of more toxic compounds, in this case herbicides, uh, has decreased significantly over the same time frame. Otherwise put, glyphosate replaced more Glyphosate being a less toxic compound replaced more toxic uh, compounds or herbicides. So unless you've been, you know, living under a rock for the last several, several years, you know, that glyphosate, there's some information in the media saying that glyphosate is, is a probable carcinogen. 
probable human carcinogen. Uh, this is, uh, and this it goes without saying, but it, it bears repeating. Uh, this has been uh, the US EPA regulates pesticides at the federal level in the United States, the European Food Safety Authority. Um, and these are the most respected uh, regulatory authorities in the world. Uh, the European Food Safety Authority, of course, um, is responsible in, in Europe, uh, Health Canada, uh, the World Health Organization. And the interesting part here um, is that the World Health Organization is actually the parent entity of the IARC or the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And the IARC is the only organization, and they're not a regulatory organization, they are the only organization that has concluded that glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen. Uh, all these pictured here, including the World Health Organization, which is again is the parent entity, uh, the IARC or the International Agency for Research on Cancer, have all concluded glyphosate is likely not carcinogenic to humans. So again, the International Agency for Research on Cancer in March of 2015 concluded that glyphosate was a group 2A probable carcinogen, human carcinogen, along with consuming fried foods, consuming beef, pork, lamb, being a hairdresser, and and night shift work, and you see some other, uh, this is according to the IR classification scheme, you see some other uh, human carcinogens and how they're grouped here. But again, they grouped glyphosate in here as a group 2A probable carcinogen in March of 2015. So if you go back two slides, you, you'll remember I said that the, the IARC is the only organization that has concluded glyphosate as a probable carcinogen uh, the US EPA, as well as the EFSA or the European Food Safety Authority have all concluded uh, that glyphosate is not likely to be a carcinogen to humans. So if we have these agencies in disagreement, you know, how, how do we, um, how do we uh, reconcile that disagreement, if you will? So, and we, don't, we won't get into all the, the details here, but it's important to note that the US EPA, uh, I mean, that the registration and re-registration process for all pesticides uh, in the U.S., I mean that that process is is governed by federal law, so um, you know it's it's not like it's um, you know it's a process that's taken lightly. Every pesticide registered in the U.S. must be uh, re-registered, which includes a review at least once every 15 years, and again it, it follows a very systematic process, uh, which is based on a, a risk assessment. Much of uh, the IARC or the International Agency of Research research on cancer, uh, much of their decision or classification was based on case studies, and some was uh, done based on correlation uh, with cancer incidents with people with historical pesticide use. Um, again, the IR classification is based on correlations and trends, and again, we don't need to get into the all the details here, but these are a couple of examples here. So, and otherwise put US EPA and European Food Safety Authority and other leading regulatory authorities, they base theirs on a risk assessment or a cause and effect. Whereas uh, the IARC based theirs on correlation and correlations. So this is chicken consumption. The top panel here is chicken consumption versus uh, crude oil imports. The bottom panel here is num number of non-commercial space launches associated with a number of PhDs awarded in, in sociology. You see here on the top, you know, they're 90% correlated. Uh, on the bottom panel, they're nearly 80% correlated. But the presence, the point is the presence of a strong correlation does not signify a cause and effect relationship. In other words, these are two examples of things that are correlated, yet they're not related. Uh, they're not related from a cause and effect standpoint. Um, and just to, to say what this means, otherwise, no pesticide regulatory authority in the world currently considers glyphosate to be a cancer risk to humans at the exposure to which humans are, are exposed. Again, the IR used correlation um, um, statistics and not cause and effect and not um, uh, exposure assessment and risk assessments. So it's important to note, you know, when we talk about the difference in correlations and we talk about the difference in risk assessment and hazard versus risk, you know, we all take, and perhaps this isn't the best picture here since this guy isn't uh, really using the crosswalk, but nonetheless, we all take risk uh, each and every day, right? 
And how do we mitigate those risks? Well, in the example of, you know, crossing the street, you know, and hopefully we, we use crosswalks and we, you know, follow the street crossing sign and pedestrian crosswalk areas and so forth. With pesticides, so on the label itself, uh, there are components on there which address it from a human health standpoint. Largely, that's with the personal protective equipment <coughs> section of the label, excuse me. And from the environmental um, standpoint, you know, application rates, number of applications that can uh, be made per season, uh, and, you know, buffer zone, uh, required buffer zones, as well as, you know, tank mix partners and, and, and things of, of the like that, that, that protect the environment. So, you know, how do we mitigate risk? Well, from a human health standpoint, uh, with pesticides, we do it via PPE or personal protective equipment. And from an environmental standpoint, uh, in many cases, you know, the label has, you know, the label is the law, obviously, and it's, uh, it has components on there which, which preserve uh, the environmental health. So, you know, we, we talk about, you know, you know what, what do we do if questioned about using glyphosate? And again, we can talk, we can insert any, your, whatever your favorite pesticide or herbicide is here. And, you know, that there's all types of alternatives and that's part of the discussion, right? When you're talking with whomever it may be. And, you know, when you talk about alternatives, are there alternatives to glyphosate? Sure. Are they as good? In many cases, they're not. And, you know, in some cases there are efficacious alternatives, but, you know, this again should be part of the conversation and we should all use this as a, uh, as a platform to educate people that, that may or may not uh, have as much background knowledge specifically in uh, glyphosate and other herbicides. So, and again, when you talk about alternatives, you know, when, specifically when you're thinking about glyphosate prevention, you know, hand weeding, you know, other chemicals, non-chemical alternatives, other synthetic herbicides, uh, selective post herbicides, again, all these should be part of the conversation. So is, is steam an option? Well, maybe, um, you know, from an efficacy standpoint, um, you know, you typically don't obtain the same level of control uh, of many species. And obviously there are um, worker protection issues with, with steam. Um, um, so again, all those have to be uh, thrown into the mix. Are flame weeders uh, uh, an uh, efficacious alternative? Uh, maybe, but again, there are other, other things that must be considered. Uh, hot foam and or steam, again, you know, when you think about this, um, you know, the economics of it, specifically with uh, some of these types of machine, I mean, one piece of equipment, you know, is, and there's several municipalities in the state of North Carolina that have purchased these. And I mean, they're, they're spending $40,000 for a steam or a hot foam uh, applicator, which in, in most cases is not nearly as efficacious. And again, it has other, uh, other risk associated with it. Natural products, do they work? Well, if you lower your expectations enough, they 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 may uh, they may work, but you know when you talk about actually controlling problematic species, you know in, in most cases uh, they don't offer the same level of control. And this is just looking at you know when you compare it to other synthetic herbicides. And again, this is just one example. May or may not be used in the particular uh, sites that you all are uh, managing pest in or managing weeds in, but. You know, just it's just a different way to think about it. So when you think about you know weed control, you know annuals versus perennial, uh, leaching or off-target um, uh, potential, uh, as well as you know mammalian toxicity. You know if if you look at glyphosate compared to these other synthetic herbicide alternatives, um, you know glyphosate looks looks pretty favorable, and you know all the fear mongering that's been um, that's been occurring. You know, is is it really is it is it unfounded or is it substantiated? And again, you know, this is part of the conversation that we all need to have, and and use it as an educational standpoint. Again, when you think about, you know, there's several pesticides listed here, several herbicides listed here, uh, particularly. And when you think about glyphosate, you know, acute oral toxicity being very low, uh, whereas you think about, you know, some some of the other products as well as some of the other, um, you know, like aspirin, uh, as well as some of the other uh, common products that we use, including um, in, including some household products, you know, glyphosate has a very high acute oral LD50, indicating it's very low um, uh, toxicity. 
So, and again, I don't want to use this as a, as a, um, um, as something that, that indicates that the glyphosate may be banned in the future has here, obviously it's been banned in some parts of the world. I don't, I don't think it's going to be banned here by any stretch of the imagination. But again, it's important to think about things, you know, from a 30,000 feet view or, or holistically from a, um, uh, from a pest management standpoint. And if you think about, you know, if glyphosate was banned, you know, what, what are the impacts of it? You, of course, reduced uh, farm income, increased food prices, uh, increase in the use of herbicides, uh, increased carbon emissions. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So less uh, agronomic crop production, so increased prices of, of everything, right? Uh, net increase in the use of herbicides. So otherwise put, and when we say net increase in the use of herbicides, amount of product per unit area is, is really irrelevant. What is relevant is when we talk about glyphosate, it's you know a low to moderate use rate. And when we say um, low to moderate use rate, that's based on pounds on the ground. Again, the amount of product used per unit area is is really irrelevant. But if you took glyphosate out of the mix, you would be making more applications of, in many cases, higher use rate products. And it would, it, it would increase the amount of herbicides that we actually introduce into the environment. And of course, when you talk about reduced glyphosate use, you know, if you reduce that use, then you're gonna be relying on tillage uh, more, particularly in agronomic crops. Uh, so increased carbon emissions. Um, and I'll, I'll end here by saying, you know, where are we with this uh, glyphosate use? And again, you can in insert your favorite pesticide here, herbicide. So special interest groups advancing specific agendas, uh, basically fear mongering uh, based off one agencies. And again, they're not a regulatory authority um, that has concluded that glyphosate is a group 2A probable carcinogen, that agency being the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, and in reality, that's, you know, it's spread like wildfire because in many cases, individuals are scared of things they're unfamiliar with and or don't understand how they work. So, you know, like ethanol or alcohol, sunlight, nicotine uh, are all classified as known carcinogens uh, and people, um, you know, may be exposed to these at much higher level than glyphosate and they, they you know, they, they're safe. Uh, they feel like they're safe assuming the risk uh, of known carcinogens because they, they think they understand how they work and they think they understand the classification of them. Yet they're, you know, they're, they're scared, if you will, of something that's been uh, classified by, as a probable carcinogen by one agency. And again, not even a regulatory authority. And that's largely based on people just simply not understanding how pesticides work. So otherwise put, researchers can distribute uh, all the science, scientific information. Uh, and the reality of it is that less of these articles will gain traction compared to fla uh, flashy headlines. And this is an actual headline from, uh, I can't, it was one of the Home and Garden magazines several years, years ago, but glyphosate is killing your child. <laughs> so, you know, you hate to laugh about it, but it's, it's the world we live in. So with that, I'll take this opportunity to answer any questions or clarify anything. Uh, my apologies, that was kind of a it's kind of a hard topic to cover in 25 or 30 minutes. But if there's any questions or comments, I'll be happy to clarify them. All right, thanks, Dr. Gannon. Uh, let's see, we did have one. Uh, one question come in. Are you seeing wider adoption of glufosinate in agricultural systems? That's a great question. And, you know, it really depends on uh, the, the site. And so glufosinate is, is, is really good on, you know, smaller uh, weeds. But, you know, once many weeds get a lot of size on them, it's not, not as efficacious. So, is there an uptick in glufosinate? Absolutely, but not across all systems because, you know, it doesn't offer the same level of control as, as glyphosate, particularly when you're talking about perennial species. All right, we got uh, like maybe time for uh, one more. 
Um, and then <clears throat> there's a few more, but we can send those to you and uh, get some responses for that. But how do adjuvants included in glyphosate formulations, have those been tested? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, adjuvants, so, so some of the um, adjuvants have been tested and some of the scrutiny specifically around um, glyphosate is that uh, some of the adjuvants have not been tested adequately. And so the adjuvants have been tested, whether or not they've been tested adequately um, and what are the specific effects of adjuvants uh, on the human tox side, I, I, I can't speak to that, but specifically from the environmental side, um, you know, obviously there are different formulations for those that are used in a, aquatic sites and so forth, which contain a different adjuvant, right? But specifically from a human tox um, standpoint, um, they have been tested, and I can't, I, but I can't speak to the specific uh, properties. All right, thanks, Doctor Gannon. We did have a few more questions, but we'll we can uh, send those to you, um, you know, after the meeting. Um, okay. We can get some get some answers to those. Thank you. Um, so, well, yeah, thanks again. That was the, a great presentation and um, definitely a lot of misinformation out there. And it's, um, you know, hard to, um, you know, combat that misinformation, but um, it's definitely something worthwhile um, and that, you know, that needs to be done. Um, sure. So, because I know I've had my fair share of people when I'm out spraying, um, you know, taking pictures of me or, you know, they're coming up and asking me and, you know, telling me I'm killing, you know, certain things that, you know, that we're, we're not targeting and that kind of stuff. So, um, so, well, thank you again. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to our next presenter, um, Leslie Stark with the, um, the North Carolina.